How long does it take you to finish the first draft of a screenplay? That can, I mean, that certainly just varies, I think, on the subject matter. You know, if you're in a, in a, in a dramatic genre, I think it'll take a bit longer. Comedy, it's not my strongest suit, but I do love it. I think comedy is extremely hard to write. I mean, how are you going to craft all of these jokes? I mean, that's that's wild to me. Um, but because I've been living in this like suspense, thriller, mystery world for quite a while now, I would say that a first completed feature feature script um, probably takes me two or three weeks for the first draft. I think my my fastest draft that I ever did, which was like a true life drama, so you know, it was different. I was pulling from my own experiences. That one took me about a week. And then I, I was trying to submit it to a writing competition. I was trying to like, you know, one of those one of those big writing competitions. So I was under the gun to get it done. That was all I was doing is working on that script. And then my shorts, I mean, my shorts I'll take um, an hour or two to craft. You know, a short film is a little bit different, at least the ones that we make, because we understand what our limitations are. We, we try to make our short films something that we know that we can create for a certain, you know, kind of respectable budget. Um, and so knowing those parameters, I know exactly kind of where my, where my story can go and where my story needs to kind of like find a way to, to stay within the bounds. So that, that could just take me a couple hours. So you're wanting to do horror thriller or like true, like true crime? Oh, no, I, I, I do love a uh, horror thriller. I, I'm just I'm a huge like mystery junkie. Like I just love the good mystery. Doesn't have to be true. If it is true, cool. Like it's exciting. Um, but I, I do just love a good mystery. I, like thrilling. Like anytime I can be on the edge of my seat with the thrills, I'm I'm really there for it. So and then if you can throw a twist in, I mean, that's all you need. <laughs> do you remember the TV show Unsolved Mysteries? Yes. Oh, it was not terrifying. Great. It was terrifying, terrifying with the music and, and they're still Stocks unsolved. Voice. You're like, oh right, my right. God. This murderer is so walking among us unsolved. <laughs> right. Or there was one story where they hadn't seen a woman and the last that they re reported, she might have been wearing some old clothes that were wet walking down a country road. Oh. And they weren't sure if that was she was still alive and where yeah. did she go. Yeah. And I'll never forget that, just that scene that they'd had an actor oh. replay her. And she was still alive and she wasn't harmed, but I, it was murky about what had happened. Right. That is like terrifying right there. Yeah. And there's just something in that. And there's no gore in it. It's right. just this sort of unknown. And so where did she go? She was walking, but then later on you found out that she was fine? Or They never sure? found either way. <gasps> see, they, that, yeah. that is a jumping off point. <laughs> that is that, that to see so clearly is like, I see it. Let's jump from here. All right. Let's figure out what did happen to this woman either before or after. Probably not after because we're going to leave that mystery out there. Oh, right. I love that. You should write that. Well, I guess that she they thought maybe she got clothes from a clothesline. And so oh, then she okay. was like, and for some reason she was drenched and, and some, some passersby saw her on a country road walking. Interesting. And it was never determined. She was never found huh? and it was never determined where she was going. But that image of just this mysterious woman on this lone road was just yeah. so vivid and yeah. You see it so clearly. I, mm -hmm. I would be interested to see uh, a script about that one. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure it'll make Maybe. it to the yeah. afternoon, but yeah. <laughs> we'll it's try to write yourself yeah. a little email okay. and be like, future. <laughs> yeah, I'll, future notes to Karen. Yes, yeah. exactly. Once a draft is done, what are you doing from there? First draft? Sure, yeah. first draft. First draft, I mean, I'm, I'm, I will always probably have certain scenes that are going to be my favorite among a draft. And so I'll probably kind of like go back to those and play favorite and like live in those scenes a little bit and try and tighten them up or explore what else could be done there. Um, but I've, as I grow as a writer, I realize that that begs the question, why aren't all of the scenes your favorite? You know, and if that question is coming to mind, if you do find yourself having favorites, well, then you need to go back to the ones that are not your favorite. Those are where you really need to be living and going back to to figure out what's going on there and, and tighten that and lift it up. Because, again, like I said, once if you intend to, to make this a production yourself or if you intend to ask somebody else to fund it or another production company to, to come on board, I mean, don't waste anyone's time. Don't waste your own time. Like, make this the best possible thing. So after a first draft... I may walk away from it for just a little while, like a day or so, um, probably not more than a day at that. 
and and just kind of like keep rereading it, read it again, read it over again, watch another, watch a movie, kind of like see what characters they created in a, and it doesn't have to be a similar movie, it can be any movie, just a movie that, you know, kind of gives you the, that flutter of excitement and see what they did really well and be like, okay, am I doing that well? Or is my character's journey really, really clear? Are their struggles really clear? Are they likable? All of that. Um, I think once you start, once you finish your first draft, you have an instinctual awareness as to where you need to go back and, and polish it up. And so that's that's it. I'm, I'm just polishing, polishing, waxing on, waxing off, polishing that script um, pretty much until I just can't stand it anymore. And all of a sudden now I've seen that it's actually probably become the second draft with all of those, those tune-ups and, and tweaks. Um, and of course, Aaron is very involved in all this process. It's usually both of us working together the whole time. So he's probably been involved. Maybe he's even taken the script just for himself for a few days to like tighten up and, and put some suggestions in there. Um, and then once we feel like, okay, we've, we've reached the maximum of what we're capable of, now let's send it out for some feedback from our, our trusted friends and family members. Really, our parents, quite a bit of our parents are like reading all of our stuff and sending nice. us back their thoughts. It's nice. Are you ever worried you might scare them with something you've written? Like, oh, it would be my greatest pleasure. Oh, oh, it would be good. my joy. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I mean, like, taking it a little too far, like, sure, ooh, sure. should we show mom and dad? I don't sure. know. <laughs> um, not, I mean, somewhat. Like, we we have actually scared them with Val, with the Val script, in fact. Um, so that, that was great. That was great feedback to hear that they were creeped out. Um, and yeah, yeah, just to scare them. I mean, they, they are creative and they didn't, uh, well, they're creative in their own ways as well. Not exactly in the same camp as us, but creative in their own rights and, and they give fantastic feedback. And we also appreciate that they're from a different generation. So important. Like we, I know that there's a, there's some, there's something to being niche and, you know, kind of speaking to like just maybe your own specific audience. But personally, I kind of want to, I want to cast my net. I want to be something that, you know, I want to be the sixth sense where really anyone of any age can go and check that out and really enjoy it. And so when someone from a different age group can read my work and let me know from their point of view, like this this is kind of, you know, cringy. I don't like how this character does this or I don't understand this. That's a wonderful piece of information because people need to understand what we're about to create. They absolutely need to know if either it's tech-based or it's just kind of maybe something that the characters do and that's more of like a generational thing. Okay, now I can explain the way that this character is doing this weird, you know, generational like ritual, like social media or what have you. Um, in a better light so that now this this different generation can understand it as well. Sure, because if you think about Carrie, if there had been social media mm. during that time for oh the my movie, gosh. what a different a, a different turns it could have taken. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Well, with horror, personally, I can't stand technology in horror. Unless, now, there are some, some caveats. Like I just recently watched Host on Shudder. Um, fantastic. The, if, if I'm to understand correctly the story, um, the director had done this as like a practical practical joke. It, it's a scary story that happens over Zoom. He did a, something as a practical joke for his friends. The story kind of went viral in some way, and then he got funded by Shutter. What you know? Th these are the details I read on some article. Um, and then he made this movie, and I think the budget for the movie was around like thirty thousand dollars, and it all happens on Zoom. And that was a time where I watched that movie and I was like, wow, I, I felt like he did something, even though it's all living here in, in the screen, you know, the whole movie takes place right there. I felt like it was, a, it was he, would, he had really made it tight. He had really made sure that it was tight and the characters were interesting to follow. And I, I just loved what he had created. Um, and so that's where that gets me into the social media, like the technology aspect of horror or scary stories. If you're just living in a regular world like a modern day world and all of your characters can quickly you know pick up their cellular phone that has connection everywhere on the globe and you know dial anyone the stakes are they they naturally are lower you know your characters have so many more lifelines to kind of save themselves so you as the writer need to figure out okay straight away i either need to cut the ties of technology either explain to my viewer for some reason or another there's no service in this area or you know whatever it's like you try and come up with something as new and as original as you can, um, or you're going to set it in a time period that's not quite te technologically advanced, like we're living in at this at present moment. Um, a lot of my stories kind of lean a little bit more in the 90s. Like I try to kind of tell stories more in the 90s because certainly technology is 
just on the precipice of booming, but it is not like in our hands, like right here constantly as a lifeline. Um, and that's really more in like the horror genre that I'm working in. But I feel like Hereditary, that was a modern story and I didn't see a lot of technology used in it, but it didn't feel like it was missing either. Right, I agree. Yeah. So I, I think that they did a really elegant way of, of handling that. So that, you know, it's 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 kind of exciting. It's a new challenge for writers with, as technology can, continues to advance. How are you going to tell the scariest story without, you know, kind of when I see tech on screen, it kind of, I don't know, it's different from seeing an old musky, like out in the woods, English manor, you know, where your characters are trapped versus they're in a modern home with like everything at their disposal on their, you know, at the touch of their hand. Um, you know, it's different. And as a writer, you need to try and figure out how to tell that, tell that story the best you can. Yeah. Her Hereditary could have actually been in the seventies if they just had changed their wardrobe and the clothes. Exactly. It, yeah. it could have actually been that, you know, yeah. just had, had that feel to it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I don't really recall much tech, but I also don't recall being like, where is the tech? I think that this, the characters weren't in situations where they had to call each other that often. They were all like living in the house. Right. If I'm thinking, didn't he go to a party, the mm. son, though? He was at, like, this party and he was yeah. bored and yeah. he didn't fit in or whatever. Yeah. Well, the, the young girl doesn't fit in as well. As oh, right. The, right. Uh, <laughs> right. And okay. then, Sorry. And then that cut to me in the movie theater, like, we paid money for this. Like, I mean, right. now I, like, I say that lightly because I love that I saw that, but I couldn't eat for probably like a day after seeing that movie. I was so grossed out. I was so traumatized. There was a like, grown man next to me that was like yelling out. He yeah. was scared. And I was like, oh my God. Like, I, what did so I get myself scary. into? <laughs> it's so scary. But it was, it was I loved well it. worth it. So worth it and so rare. You know, I, I don't feel like I have that experience that often. So I'm so grateful that, that we did get that experience and I hadn't seen the trailer either. So I was really going into that movie right. like, what? <laughs> I went in fairly blind too. And yeah, people were freaked out in the yeah. theater and it was an interesting experience to be and amongst everybody. Well done to them. I'm just yeah. so happy with that. <laughs> I sure miss it. I hope those experiences come back. Me too. They, they, they will. Hopefully One they day. will. One day. A couple years maybe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>